Hi, this is Mr. Yeager, and uh, this particular unit is on the introduction to forces. What we're going to look at here is we're going to learn about Newton's three laws of motion, how to describe them, how to use them in multiple choice questions, basically. Um, and then we're going to basically go through all the different types of forces that are out there in this particular part. So this is very much an introduction. We have just finished kinematics, which is basically, again, why, how, like just describing how things move, but now we're interested in now how do things move, okay? How can you make them start moving, okay? Not just simply, what, like, are they accelerating, speeding up, slowing down, but how are they officially moving? And so that leads us to force, okay? And what we can see here is we're gonna get, obviously, to the idea of Newton's laws. This next slide, this is something for you to read on your own sometime. Um, basically goes over, obviously, who Sir Isaac Newton was, what did he provide, and obviously he's the father of physics, uh, developed the three laws of physics that we know out there, and we're going to just move on from there. It's not too much that we test on with Isaac Newton. Okay. So, what is a force? A force is a push or a pull. A push or a pull. Okay, That's the most basic definition. A more physics-oriented definition is it causes a change in motion. In other words, it creates an acceleration. Okay? So force will cause an acceleration. We'll see that pop up in one of the formulas. But here we're just looking at what are different types of forces. All these things will cause a change in motion. Okay? And so different types of forces, we're going to go over these more specifically later. We have gravitational force, also known as your weight. These are interchangeable, gravitational force and weight. We have out there what are called the electromagnetic forces. We're going to not really talk about those too much in this unit. They'll come up a little bit later. Uh, very simple, not, we're not going to get into too much detail with those. But uh, electric force and magnetic force, okay, they're both types of electromagnetic forces out there. All right. Then we're going to have tension. This is going to be a very uh, popular one. Tension is created by strings, wires, ropes, etc. Okay. Uh, we will get to what are called compression forces. In particular, we will focus on spring force in a later unit. Friction. That's a big one. And then nuclear forces, which we will maybe mention in a definition near the end of the school year. Not even this semester, at the very end of the school year. The main ones that you're going to see us review, gravitational force, tension, and friction. They're going to be our main ones for this particular unit. There are other ones out there, but we'll kind of uh, talk, to them, talk about them as they come. All right. Now, out of all those forces, gravitational, tension, uh, frictional force, okay, we can classify each of those forces as one of two types. Okay? One type is known as field forces. Okay? Field forces. These are forces that occur at a distance. Sometimes I call them the no-touch forces. I'm going to change colors here so we can see a little bit better. Okay? The no-touch forces. All right? uh, and the ones that we have here are gravitation, electric, and magnetic force. All of these forces, the objects don't have to touch and they can be felt. The one obviously we're most interested in is gravitational force caused between two masses, mass to mass. All right. um, we don't need to be touching the Earth to feel the gravitational force of the Earth. We can be completely off the Earth. Astronauts are not on the Earth, but they can still be pulled back down to the Earth in the International Space Station. Okay. And we'll get to another uh, unit on gravitation in a bit more detail with the whole idea of mass to mass. All right. but Again, the idea is the objects don't have to touch, all right? It actually has nothing to do with them even touching. Well, what's the opposite of that? Contact forces, all right? This is going to be every other force that we have out there, so please don't get confused by this. Gravitation, electric, and magnetic are your only field forces. Any other force that we make up or we use during this entire unit or throughout this year, they are going to be called contact forces. Exactly as it is stated there, contact means touch. Okay? These are this is a force that is created when the objects come into contact. All right? So let's get into Newton's laws. Here we go. Newton's first law. An object at rest 
tends to remain at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. We got continuation here. Okay, well, not yet. Obviously, it's not the complete law. Okay, but the whole point of this law is an object will keep doing what it's doing unless acted upon differently. Okay, in the classroom, this I usually do the tablecloth trick. Okay, that's where obviously you've probably seen that before. We get all the pieces on the tablecloth and I pull the tablecloth out from underneath of it. All right. That is an illustration of Newton's first law because I am only acting on the tablecloth. Everything else should remain at rest. So an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. I'm going to already mention this now. We're going to say an outside net force. And we'll talk about what net force means a little bit later. Now, continuation of the law is an object in motion will remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. All right? So we say these together. An object at rest or an object in motion will continue to do what it's doing unless acted upon by this outside force. And another term for this law, this is the only law that has a special name to it as well, is we call this the law of inertia. We're going to talk about inertia basically on the next slide. All right? But I think I have a little animation here. Okay. This is the whole idea of why a, I mean, you know, this is not the happiest explanation, but why it's so important to wear your seatbelt, okay? Because the idea is you're in motion while inside that car, all right? The only thing that will crash into the, uh, that when you crash, only the car is acted on, and so you will keep on going, as you see this guy right here flipping over that wall, fortunately, okay? Um, but... You know, another silly example is my computer right now that I'm talking to. It's going to stay at rest. It's going to stay right there. I shouldn't start seeing it move. If I see it move, I'm going to probably leave the classroom because I don't know what's going on in here. All right? So it will continue to stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. An object in motion will continue to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, the law of inertia. All right? Other examples, you got the ladder coming off there. All right, only a truck is, added, is acted on, but that would mean that you didn't even tie the ladder down. Okay. So again, to, all, to narrow it all down here, okay, if you want to change what an object is doing, you're going to have to apply a force. A force will cause a change in motion. Was it at rest? What's it doing, basically? Okay. If there is no change to the object's motion, we can already say that there is no net force acting on the object. And again, I'll go ahead and say it now. Net force is basically saying there is no, if there are any forces acting on it, they're equal and they're canceling out. It's like a tug of war. I pull five newtons one way, you pull five newtons the other way. We're not going to move at all. Okay? So there's, we're, we're at what's called this equilibrium state. So, as long as it's not moving, there is no net force acting on the, on the object. This is going to be a very common question. We'll talk about a spaceship in outer space. It fires its rockets and then shuts off its rockets. What's it going to do? A lot of people say it's going to start slowing down, but if you're in outer space where there's no friction, it's just going to continue going in a straight line at that last velocity. It'll keep doing what it's doing. All right. Same thing goes with all the planets. This is a crazy idea, but if the sun just all of a sudden disappeared, the sun is what's causing the Earth to orbit around and around in a circle or an ellipse around uh, an object. Obviously, the Earth is rotating around the sun based on its gravitational force. All right? If the sun all of a sudden just went poof and went away, the Earth would not stop. It would just continue going in a straight line away from where it's going. If I draw that out, basically, if I go around and around, wherever the last direction of motion is, that's the direction I'm going to keep going, but there's no more force being applied to it. All right. And basically this is what it's saying as well. An object that can be at rest or, this is the other thing people miss, if you move at a constant speed, you can keep on moving at a constant speed. That's the space shuttle. That's my Earth example right now. It'll keep moving how it was moving at the last moment of force, and it won't change, it won't accelerate. If there's no force, there's no acceleration. Okay? So, again, these are the two ways that an object could be moving if there's
there's no net force. If there's no net force, it can be at rest, this is worth making sure you get, or going a constant velocity. So there are two things an object can be doing when there's no net force. All right? That is what this first law is stating very clearly. All right? We call this being at a state of equilibrium. If there is no net force, okay? When we have balanced forces, this means that we have no net force. All right? That means all forces acting on it in a particular direction, either horizontally or vertically, are equal. And it will either stay at rest or stay at constant motion. Only when those forces become unbalanced. That means now we have a net force. That means force causes what? A change in motion, an acceleration. Okay. So let's talk about this inertia real fast. Okay. Inertia is, is an idea that a lot of students struggle with. It's, it, people all kind of mention and go, oh, it's the you know, inertia that makes it do what it's doing. Okay. It, again, it's like partially correct, but also partially wrong. It's what part is right, what part is wrong. So the way I like to describe inertia is it's basically trying to describe how it's trying, it's how much is it going to resist the change in motion. Okay. And so what you need to think about is go, okay, what will make an object more difficult to move? All right. What about the object's inertia will make it more difficult to move? All right. The higher the inertia, the higher the difficulty to make that object change how it's moving. All right. And you got to be careful here because a lot of people all think, I only want to move an object that's already at rest, but same idea, how easy is it to move to stop an object with a high inertia? Okay? So inertia is depending on two things. And one of those that everybody immediately knows is its mass. Inertia is directly related to mass. The larger the object, the more difficult it is going to be to move that object. Even if there is no friction. Okay, you can't go in outer space and go, I'm going to start pushing a planet around. Good luck. Okay? You can't even push a, you know the space shuttle out. You might be sitting there going, hey, I'm going to move the space shuttle. You will, okay, it will technically start moving, but barely at all because it has a very high inertia. Okay? So, mass is one measure for inertia. The more mass of the object, the more inertia it has. Okay, I use football all the time as an example. Okay, this is why a lot of running backs, if you watch football, if any athlete that's very big, muscular, they're tougher to stop. Okay? They don't have to be tall, but if, as long as they have a lot of mass to them, a lot of muscle, they're going to be more difficult to stop versus something that's, you know, a gymnast. A gymnast usually obviously are very light in order to, for themselves to make sure they can move very well. Okay? They're easier to change the motion of the object. All right? You have this large aircraft carrier. Clearly, just think about how long it's going to take that thing to stop. When does, it, when does it probably shut off its engines when it docks? If you've been on a cruise ever, you know, how long do they already shut off the engines and you just coast to the dock? Even a little bit. Okay? So the heavier the object, the more difficult it is to stop. Again, this is another one. Don't think about, I mean, we already used the ship, so I guess that was a good example. But think of how long it takes this train to actually start moving. All right, that engine is probably running some already, and then it's going uh, push, chugga, 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 going, you know, ever so faster, but very, very slowly. At the same time, you're not going to be able to stop that train on the on a dime. You can't hit the brakes and go, oh, it's going to stop in 10 feet. Nope. Even think about your own cars. That's why we have so many car crashes. People think they can stop their cars so quickly. You need that two car length space, depending on how fast you're going. Okay. Now, the one thing that most people forget about inertia is it doesn't just simply depend on mass. It also depends on speed. And so the faster the object is, the more inertia it has. All right? It's going to be a lot easier to catch that 45 mile per uh, baseball than, I hope nobody throws a 300 mile per hour baseball at me, but that's not going to be fun to stop. Okay. So, the thing is here, this is a kind of a very broad PowerPoint going over a lot of things in following force. 
Let's quickly talk about the difference between mass and weight. And I feel like this is something you probably had covered way back in uh, uh, middle school or even in another science class at some point. Okay? We know mass and weight should not be the same. Okay? And the thing is that we're going to have to try to make sure we don't make the mistake on is weight is a force. When you measure weight, you're measuring a force. How much are you being pulled by gravity? Okay? So that is a force on there. That is not mass. Okay? So, again, going with weight, it will depend on gravity. Weight depends on gravity. Okay? Mass does not. I'm going to go back there for a second. Sorry. Okay? Mass, just to make sure it's clear, is just saying it's just a measure of substance. Measure of of how much you are. That's simply how I put it. How much you are. What I mean by that is simply this is you. You are this much. You know, it's not like you travel to the moon and your arm falls off. Okay, you can't take that with you. Now, your body goes all the way to the moon. Your mass, what you are, does not change. The thing is, how much force you apply to the ground will change, and that is your weight. All right. So weight, it depends on gravity. Mass does not. Mass is the same everywhere. All right. So that leads us to the metric unit for force, and that is the newton, n. Okay. There is a conversion you can see up here, not really worth remembering, but it's there. Okay. One kilogram mass is equal to 9.8 newtons of force. So this is mass. This is actually a force. Okay? There is a conversion factor involved in there, so that you, they aren't exactly equal to each other. I shouldn't actually have that. They're not exactly equal. All right? So, um, a Newton, we will say that's the, that's the uh, it measures every force, so don't be sitting there asking me, what is frictional force measured by? Something different? No, it's force. Okay? It's Newtons. All right? But it does lead us to our first formula. Okay? which should become second nature. Weight equals mass times 9.8 meters per second squared. All right, sometimes we write this, I'll write it over here. Weight equals m times g. This is a formula you need to basically be able to do anytime I ask you to, basically by the end of this, by the end of next week, okay? This should not be a question of how do I do weight? Okay, weight is something that should be able to be done very quickly. It's simply the mass times 9.8. Now I will tell you, I will absolutely tell you, you can use 10. Teaching AP Physics, they actually allow us to use 10. So I don't know why you can't use it then in regular physics. You should be able to. Okay? Because it's basically the same thing. I'll let you choose. I'm not going to be mad. You can use 9.8 for G, or you can use 10. This is G. Okay? We already know what G is. All right? So that's how we calculate weight. And so here we go. Let's talk about weight a little bit more. Now we're getting into what are the different types of forces. All right. So weight is, again, how much pull is, caused, is on your mass from a gravitational field. All right. A very important thing, because we're going to get to drawing soon, is that weight always, always, always and forever will point straight down when we're doing any problem on Earth or on any other planet. It's pointing straight down to the center of the Earth. Okay? That's why, you know, we're not going to sit there and be like, oh, over in China, their weights must be pointing up. No. According to them, they'd be saying that's pointing down. Don't get into all that craziness. Okay? So weight always, always goes straight down. All right? We'll get to that when we start drawing what are called our force diagrams or free body diagrams. Okay? And again, Earth's gravitational field would be 9.8 or 10. If you go to another planet, I'll give that to you. I'll give you the G. Or maybe you have to solve for it based on what I already have for you. Oh, last thing down here, I almost forgot, is what will be the symbol for weight? Okay? Now, we're going to be doing, again, these drawings I'm talking about, these force diagrams soon, which involve drawing arrows and then labeling those arrows as what type of force. Down at the bottom here is, are three possible symbols that you could use for the force of weight. I'll add another one. You could just do a big W, and that is a symbol. Basically, 
is basically the rule is you can use any symbol you want as long as it makes sense. Obviously, these are ones that make sense. Okay? Uh, F obviously being force, force of gravity, force of weight, force of mg, which is weight. Okay? All of them equal weight. Or my AP students mainly use big W. Okay? One I'll tell you never to use, and I've had to make sure kids don't use, don't, tell, don't use little g. Little g means acceleration due to gravity. That would be one I don't accept you can be marked off. Okay? So any of these symbols down here are good to show me that's representing weight. Okay? Jumping to Newton's third law. Jumping to Newton's third law. What happened to the second law? I don't know. We'll get back to it. Okay? For third law, it gets into the, act, uh, the idea of for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Okay? Equal opposite reaction. Okay? So, what do we mean by this? This is one actually that people struggle with the most. This is one of the hardest ones, and I would recommend watching that uh, Hewitt Druid video on this as well. Uh, you probably also saw it on the, uh, the really good Force uh, Newton's Law video I put on It's Learning. But the idea here is first off, okay, there are no lone forces. That's one of the first things to understand. An object can't create a force all by itself. There must be an interaction between two objects. Okay? There must be two objects involved to create a force. Okay? Two objects to create force. I'm going to keep adding some things here. All right? What we are saying is the force acting between those two objects will be the same. So what we're saying is the ball applies a force to the bat, the bat applies a force back to the ball. Does either one pr provide a larger force? The answer would be no. Every single force between those two objects is the same. Okay? This, I don't know what this is, an apple? Apple A and Apple B, there, A is pulling on B, B is pulling on A, it's equal. They are equal, equal, equal forces acting on each other. All right? So this is a very difficult topic because we're going, okay, what, you know, wait a minute, that ball is, that baseball is about to fly off. The, the bat must create a larger force. Not in its own little interaction, not between just the baseball and the bat. They create equal forces on each other. Otherwise, this third law is completely void. All right? So there's equal opposite reactions between any two objects interacting with each other. All right? So we call this force pairing. All right? Forces will always come in pairs and will always act equal and opposite against each other. So what we're saying is, again, right here is just saying there's a force between object A and object B. Force, the force A to B refers to object A acting on B. Force B to A is force object B acting on A. If this is two newtons right up here, this must be two newtons. Now I could technically say one is negative two because I add the direction to it, but they are equal and opposite forces acting on each other. Always, always, always. Alright. So, a skater pushes backward on the ice, the ice will push the skater forward. Okay? The skate versus the ice, ice versus the skate. One other example I'm going to do right now that I get people all the time is what creates your weight? Well, we just went over that. That would be the earth pulling you down. That is a force. The earth pulling you down. Well, we just said that these forces must come in pairs. So what's the reaction? What is the reaction to this action? The person must actually be pulling the earth up. All right. Very strange idea there. And we'll do a little problem. I'll do a couple. I'll do another video with a couple problems here. Let's know what we mean by this. But this is true. The force that the earth pulls me down. I am currently pulling the earth up. With the exact same amount of force is pulling me down. And obviously the question is, well, why doesn't the earth come up with me? 
we'll talk about it technically is you know it is actually rising up to be a little bit but I mean it's it's gonna be so small never being able to be uh, you know actually felt or seen in any way and also obviously all these other people are pulling on the earth as well okay so we call this action reaction pairs action reaction pairs action reaction that's a T that's a C right here action reaction pairs okay you need to go if this object acts on another object reverse it what's the reaction to that the, uh, the object B acting on A okay it's a weird weird idea to be talking about and it's one that I know confuses students every time okay so I mean that's again showing some more pictures here okay the tire pushes back on the ground so actually the ground pushes forward that it's actually friction that's making you move forward if you push against a fridge the fridge will push you back okay this is the example of the space shuttle is being pulled by the earth well guess what that means the earth is being pulled by the space shuttle equal opposite forces all the time So, I think it's going to mention force pairs here. Yep. You cannot create a force on by its own. Okay. It has to occur between two objects. So, that's the key to Newton's third law. Newton's second law is a formula. Okay. And it's, it's clear right there. The formula is the net force of an object will equal its mass times its, its acceleration, or F net equals M times A. This is going to be our main formula we're going to be using during this whole unit, and actually next unit. Okay, the nice thing is these two, the next two units go together. Okay? And so what we're going to be looking at here is how are these related? How are these related? Well, if I increase the mass of the object and I keep acceleration the same, what will happen to force? It will increase. And again, the video that you watched, hopefully before this one, or looking at the PowerPoint, basically gave you some really good examples of what happens if I push two objects with different masses with equal force one will accelerate faster than one with a greater force. Okay? So, it's just a basic formula, F net equals M times A, and you're going to get some good practice with that. Pretty straightforward formula. All right? And so this leads us to net force. Okay? Net force is the total force acting on the object. Okay? What is the total force acting on the object? All right? So the real way we actually write this whole formula, F net equals MA, is it's also equal to what we call sigma F. Sigma means sum of forces. And so we're going to actually start describing what actual forces are acting on the object. Is it weight? Is it friction? Am I pulling it? Is there an applied force or a tension? And so forth. And so a net force can be found either by doing M times A or adding up all of the forces. Okay? And again, that's another little confusing thing that people struggle with sometimes. So, let's go through these types of forces. This is the end of this. We have what's called weight. We have the normal force. We have friction. We have tension. We have applied. Okay? And we'll go through each of those on another slide. Okay? Real quick, with free fall, all right, and again, this is actually going to come up again on another when we do when I do a free body uh, lecture. All right, during free fall, all right, which we've talked about in kinematics, free fall means the only thing acting on you is gravity, and so therefore the only force acting on you during free fall will be weight. Okay. Now we say it feels weightless. Don't worry about that. That'll come later. Okay. Okay, so talking about individual forces, you saw that giant list and then I zoomed on. Okay, weight. This next actually very, very important force is called the normal force. Okay, the normal force, which we will abbreviate simply as norm, as FN or just capital N. I'll admit you can pretty much abbreviate all of the forces based on their first letter. Okay, big N. All right, so what is this normal force? We say it's a surface force. You'll get this very quickly. Initially, it's kind of weird, but pay attention to the definition. Okay? A normal force is a pushback force. It's what a surface is pushing back, usually against your weight. It doesn't have to be your weight, but usually back against your weight. We call this a normal force. OK? 
Okay? And a normal force will always, always not point up, but point perpendicular to the surface. All right? So this is a normal force, this is a normal force, this is a normal force. That arrow is pointing the direction of the normal force coming from the surface. And you can see it's always perpendicular to the surface. In both of these, the surface is uh, basically uh, uh, at an angle. It's at an angle. We, all, we still point it perpendicular to the surface, not up. That's the biggest mistake I see people make. They tell me normal force points up, and I go, no, no, no. Okay? It points perpendicular to the surface. If I have a wall and I push against a wall, technically the normal force here would be horizontal. That would be the normal force. If I push against my board, it pushes me back straight perpendicular out from the board. All right. So this is actually showing you what uh, we're going to get to in another video, a free body diagram, a horizontal surface. You push up, okay? if you push flat, the normal force should go up. You can see grab weight or gravitational force going straight down. Again, this will be covered in a different video. Frictional force. I know it's tough to see over there. It's denoted, oops, it's denoted FF or lowercase f. Do not do uppercase f. That means force. All right. Friction is also another surface force. We do sometimes call it a surface force still because it, it will only exist when you're on a surface. Now we can get into air friction. Don't bother me about that one. We'll usually just call that air resistance F of air. All right. But obviously if you're trying to slide across a rough surface, you're going to slow down. Something's going to stop you. It's going to point in the opposite direction of motion. Friction always points opposite direction of motion. All right. And so... Frictional force will always be parallel to the surface and always in the opposite direction of motion. Now you got to be careful here. It's in the, it points in the opposite direction that it would the object would like to start moving. Okay, it could already be moving or it could be trying to move. Opposite, the frictional force will point opposite of that. Okay. So I usually do this in class. If I look at these diagrams down below, if this is the frictional force, that means this object must be going to the right. This object, if this is the frictional force, must be going down the ramp. Okay, same thing with this one, down the ramp. So it will always point opposite and parallel to the surface. Other forces that come up that we don't need to give specific, you know, big long definitions to, there will be tension, okay? This will usually be, to be written simply as T. Okay. Uh, there's compression forces pushing. Um, we usually just call this F applied, F of A, applied force. That would be basically any of your pushing or pulling forces. All right. There's also spring force out there, but we're going to ignore that for now. All right. So I think we have we end with this example. Okay. We have a box sliding to the right on a rough level ground. What forces are acting on it? Well, the answer would be we'd have weight. We'd have a normal force because it's on the ground. There's frictional force also because it's on the ground. There's no other sign that a force is being applied to make it continue going to the right. And I'll mention that in just a second here with mistakes people make. And so this leads us to what you're going to see as your first free body diagram. And obviously I'm going to get another video out in just a second with it. But what we're going to do is basically you draw arrows coming from the object and then drawing in the direction of all the forces. So basically I have an arrow down for the weight, an arrow up for the normal perpendicular from the surface, and an arrow to the left for friction because it said this object is moving to the right. It has a velocity to the right. All right. One mistake I usually get is, I'll write it out right here, there is no force of motion. What I see people do is they go, that object's moving to the right. So that means something must be pushing to the right. Thing is, based on the problem, does it say somebody is pushing the box still to the right? And the answer is no. 
Did somebody probably push it? Probably, but I'm not interested in the history of this box. All right? So it just depends on what is happening at that snapshot. And at this snapshot, this box, all you'd see is this box sliding across the floor, nobody pushing it. And these are the only three forces acting on the box at that particular moment in time. Okay? So do not include a force of motion. So again, we're going to call these things free body diagrams. I'm going to just kind of leave, leave this as is because I'm going to cover this in another video. Okay? So that's what we're going for. Okay? That's my reference. So that's it, all right? And so we will continue on from there. Main ideas, what were the three of Newton's laws? All right, make it sure to distinguish which one represents what type of a situation. What are the different types of forces? Okay, and I think what basically that's it. We went over a little bit about inertia, mass, and weight. So that's it, thank you.